It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well. As you can see, I am not in my garage. I am not by Lake Superior, but uh, today I am in our side yard out in front of a pear tree. And we will get to that in just a moment as to the relevance for tonight's lesson. I'm actually recording this on Monday afternoon, midday or so, and there is some kind of a storm coming in, so I hope I can beat it and get this recorded. My plan is to work the election all day Tuesday as a chief inspector for the city of Madison. It should be an interesting, interesting election. I've got two wards over at Chavez Elementary, and I'm hoping things go well, but wanted to go ahead and record this in case there is, I guess you might say, drama in my life that I need to deal with on Wednesday. Hopefully not, but uh, looking forward to getting tomorrow over with, which is uh, Tuesday at this point. So it's good to have you in our class tonight. I'm glad that you're here. If you have any updates to our prayer concerns, I hope that you will let me know by using the contact information on the screen. Uh, give me a call, send an email, get in touch with me in some way, and I would love to get those updates in the bulletin that I put out sometime on Saturday. Uh, please also remember we are having two worship services every Lord's Day morning at 9 o'clock and also at 10.30. Uh, be sure to sign up online so we can limit our numbers to 25% of our building capacity. It helps to prepare communion. And if you have any questions about that, any problems logging on in that way, get in touch with either me or with Kenna, and we'd be glad to help you with that. Uh, once again, I have a special request for those of you who are joining us on the phone line tonight. If you are calling in on a phone, if you don't have internet access, uh, I would love to have a series of lessons based on requests from our phone audience. I haven't heard from anybody at this point as of Monday afternoon, so if, if you're not watching online but you are listening, having called in on the phone, I would invite you to be thinking of what you would like to hear in sermon form. And I'm always looking for good things that we need to be studying, and I am looking for your ideas in particular. Any questions about the Bible, a favorite Bible passage that we haven't studied for a while, maybe a favorite character or Bible subject. If you could get in touch, I would appreciate that. My number is 224-0274. I would love to hear from you. Tonight we get back to our study of Luke. And by way of review, we know Luke was a medical doctor. He's writing to a man named Theophilus. And he also writes the book of Acts to the same man. And so we have volume one, volume two, basically the life of Jesus and then the life of the early church in the book of Acts. And Luke, of course, makes a point of writing in chronological order. And he also includes a lot of people who were commonly overlooked in the ancient world, women and Gentiles, uh, Samaritans, and so on. Last week, we looked at the last half of Luke chapter 12, where Jesus encourages his disciples to be ready and he compares his return to the return of a master from a wedding feast. And he's coming back in an hour that his servants do not know. And when he comes back, he will serve them. So it's opposite of the way that we might think. The master will serve his servants. But the condition is they need to be ready when he comes back. And he then compares his return to a thief coming at some unknown hour. And he made the argument that if we knew when a thief is coming, we would get ready for it. And so in the same way, uh, since we don't know when the Lord is returning, we always need to be ready for his return. He then talks about families being divided because of him, and he closes Luke 12 by encouraging his people to read the signs of the times, just like they can predict the weather based on the clouds and the direction of the wind. So also they need to realize uh, what is about to happen spiritually uh, with the arrival of Jesus and his coming as the Messiah and so on. So tonight we pick up with Luke chapter 13. So if you have a Bible, you may want to turn with me to Luke chapter 13 and maybe on the screen for those of you who can see it. But we'll start tonight with Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 5. Luke 13, 1 through 5. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those eighteen on whom the tower fell in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish." Here at the beginning of the chapter, some people come to Jesus seeming to uh, want his take on the latest tragedy. It seems that Pilate had killed some people as they were worshiping. This is uh, all we know about it. We don't have any secular record of something like this happening. 
And so we can't really speculate too much about what goes on here, but I'm wondering what they wanted Jesus to say. What were they hoping Jesus would say? Uh, we know the Jews hated the fact that they were governed by the Romans. We also know that people were hoping Jesus would rise up as some kind of political or military leader, their idea, their concept of the Messiah. We also know that Jesus is from Galilee. And so these people who were murdered were perhaps known to him. They were at least from the same place that he is from. And so I'm wondering then whether these people are trying to get Jesus mad enough to do something. Jesus, these are your people. Uh, Pilate killed them. In other words, look at this horrible thing that Pilate has done to your own people. Don't you want to rise up and handle this in some way? And so that is perhaps uh, what they are saying with this question. And yet instead of reacting as they were hoping he might react, notice how Jesus completely turns this around. Instead of focusing on Pilate, instead of focusing on the brutality, instead of focusing in on the gruesome details as they were trying to do, the blood mingled with the sacrifices and all that, uh, Jesus turns it back on the people who brought this news, and he uses this tragedy to encourage repentance. And notice he does this with a question. He wants them to think very carefully about the cause. Were the victims here any worse sinners than anybody else up in Galilee? And of course the answer is no. They did not die because they sinned in some way, but instead they died because Pilate decided to do this. Back then, many people believed that if you suffered and, and died in some spectacular way, you must have done something to deserve it. We think about the book of Job. Job's friends, some of them at least, assumed that he must have done something really bad to deserve that terrible suffering. We see the same belief expressed today, I think, as karma, we might say. What goes around comes around, that way of thinking. However, uh, that is not what happens here. Jesus, though, uses this question about these deaths to teach a spiritual lesson, because unless we repent, we will all likewise perish. Again, not that their sin caused them to be killed, but Jesus is saying here that if we keep on sinning, uh, there is some perishing on the horizon. And so it seems to me then that Jesus, as he often does, he takes something physical, he takes some current event, he takes something that he can see, that the crowd can see, and he uses it to teach a deeper spiritual lesson. There's also the possibility here that Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, isn't he? That's happening a few decades out in the future. And so if these people don't repent, they will die at the hands of the Romans, just as those Galileans did. And so there may be a spiritual part of this. Uh, there may be, I guess, a physical consequence to their spiritual re rejection of Jesus if they don't turn themselves around. And the same thing goes for the second story here, the report of 18 people being killed when a tower collapses. They died not because they sinned in some spectacular way. This was not God's direct punishment of something they were doing. But they died because a tower fell. People die for all kinds of tragic reasons. However, unless we repent, we will perish, whether physically, uh, whether spiritually. It's a bit hard to nail down here. Uh, but either way, I think we can say, uh, perishing is not the preferred outcome, right? We're not looking forward to that. And so the solution to whatever perishing it is, the solution is to repent. And so we come away with this paragraph in Luke 13, 1 through 5, with an emphasis on repentance. Whether it's us today, whether it's the Jewish people back then, uh, all of us need to repent. So let's move on to Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. Luke 13, verses 6 through 9. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put put in fertilizer and if it bears fruit next year fine but if not cut it down over and over again we know jesus tells stories the last two illustrations come from current events and this one comes from a guy who's planted a fig tree in his vineyard however he goes out and he looks for fruit on the tree and he finds nothing now this is the owner of the vineyard who, who does this and so he comes to the manager of the vineyard 
And he explains that this lack of fruit, it's gone on for a few years, three years now, it's gone without fruit. And so he tells the manager to cut it down. This is it. it it's taking up space in my vineyard. We cannot afford to have this uh, tree using up resources and, and real estate. In response, the manager basically asks for one more year, doesn't he? Give me one more chance. You know, in that year, he will dig around it, he will put in fertilizer, and then if it doesn't bear fruit after that additional year, he will go ahead and cut it down. It's interesting that we don't have a response from the owner as to whether this plan is acceptable. We assume that it is. Uh, otherwise, we'd probably see something about that here, so that's not the point of this story. But it's also interesting that we don't have an explanation of this one, do we? There's no place where he says, now hear the parable that I told here. He does not explain this. Often Jesus explains the parables, but with this one, there's nothing. And so we're kind of left to figure this one out on our own. Uh, going back to the tree situation, most of you know that I grew up with fruit trees. We had probably half a dozen fruit trees in our yard at any given time growing up. I watched my parents care for those trees for years. Uh, my job was to mow the grass <laughs> under those fruit trees and around those trees, which is a major pain. If you've ever uh, mowed around a lot of fruit trees, they have low-hanging branches, there's fruit that drops off, you're stepping on and mowing over. I remember very uh, early on mowing over the apples that would sometimes fall from those trees and having my legs covered in applesauce, basically. And I remember the, the bees and the wasp and all that going after the fruit that would fall from time to time and mowing over that and, and everything. Uh, our neighbor also had two very large apple trees in his backyard. He didn't care for them. That was not his thing. He was an airline pilot flying out of O'Hare Airport. And, um, and I remember my dad spraying the branches of our neighbor's tree that would hang over on our side of the fence. And I remember going out there and looking, and you could see these huge trees. And on the neighbor's side of the fence, there were all of these diseased, tiny little puny apples. And then on our side of the fence, the apples were just perfect. You know, not bug-eaten or anything, but they'd been sprayed through the year and taken care of. And uh, we got along a little bit with that neighbor, but that was interesting to me. Uh, when I moved to Wisconsin, the first thing we did was to plant fruit trees at our house in Janesville. Also, as soon as we moved to Madison just over 20 years ago here on the southwest side, uh, the first thing we did was to plant fruit trees. As I remember it, uh, this came at the same time that we put grass in, even before we put grass in, perhaps, because we knew that we wanted as much time as possible for those trees to mature and to bear fruit. And we also knew that it would take probably three years or so for those trees to mature to the point of bearing fruit. Seems like wasted time, but we also know how important the structure of a tree is, and that structure gets decided uh, very early on in those first few years. I, so I know what it's like uh, to plant a tree from bare rootstock, from junks, and then to put it in and water and prune and to wait several years for fruit. And I know how frustrating it is for a tree not to bear fruit after doing all of that work on it. And so I guess I would say I've done what Jesus is talking about here. This is personal. Uh, I have personally cut down fruit trees that have not brought fruit as we expected. I, I've cut down unproductive plum and apple and peach trees right here in this yard, just feet from me here. Right now we have two very productive pear trees. I'm standing in front of one of those right now. This is one that goes back uh, just over 20 years. And uh, both of the pear trees have so much fruit on them right now that the branches are starting to sag. And so I'm looking forward, hopefully, to a good pear harvest again this year. Um, our apple tree right now is currently in a life and death struggle with Japanese beetles. And despite my best efforts last year and this year and some special pesticide just for those critters, I'm afraid the beetles might be winning. But for now, the pears are looking good. For some reason, the uh, beetles don't like the pears. But the point is, cutting down an unproductive tree is a very difficult decision. You've invested literally years in something that has brought no benefit. And it's tempting to keep putting it off. Oh, maybe next year. Maybe this is the year. I can't cut it now. I've, I'm five years into this and, and so on. But you also know that the tree is taking up valuable real estate that you should really probably give to a tree that produces. But you really hate to start that three-year process all over again. And that's what the manager in this parable is feeling. He's feeling the pressure from his owner. And he's also feeling the pressure of the unproductive tree. Uh, as to an application, I wish we could discuss this in person, but I would make just a few observations here without being too dogmatic about it, I guess we might say, since Jesus himself doesn't really seem to explain this one either. 
Uh, first of all, let's realize on several occasions, Jesus compares Israel to a vineyard. And that seems to be what's going on here. And so here in this parable, it makes sense that Israel is the unproductive fig tree. They really need to be cut down. But God in his great love, his mercy, his compassion, his long suffering, he's giving them just a little bit more time. The caution is, I guess we would say, Jesus doesn't really apply it in this way, uh, but this seems to fit in with what Jesus says elsewhere. The other observation about the, is the, about the timeline here. Uh, the three-year period is interesting. At this point in his ministry, Jesus has been preaching and teaching for how long? He's been doing this for about three years, which is an interesting coincidence, if in fact that is what's going on here. I don't know whether we can make a big deal out of this, since Jesus doesn't. And so I'm just mentioning this as a possibility, that Jesus uses three years in the story since he himself has now been preaching for three years. Uh, ultimately, though, we look at this, we back away from it, and we see the importance of bearing fruit. And Jesus seems to be putting these people listening to this parable on notice. Your three years is just about up, and you really need to be paying attention and repenting. That seems to be what we can take away from this. Now let's move on to Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Luke 13, verses 10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him. And so we have a healing here. We have a woman who has been bent double, bent in half, basically, for 18 years. We find this has been caused by uh, a spirit of some kind, and so this is not a case of her uh, touching the wrong doorknob and getting a virus at random. Uh, this isn't a case of her falling off her new electric bicycle and breaking her back. Nothing like this, but a spirit or a demon of some kind has been tormenting this poor woman for 18 years. And I think uh, most of us cannot imagine being bent in half for 18 years. Cer certainly a, just a miserable way to live. But as Jesus is teaching, Jesus looks over and he sees this woman and he calls her over and he frees her from this sickness. He lays his hands on her and she immediately stands up straight and she begins glorifying God. But this is where we come to a detail that we skipped over in verse 10. Notice Jesus does all of this on the Sabbath day. And as we have discussed previously, it almost seems as if Jesus does some of these things intentionally. Yes, he could have waited until the next day. He could have done it the previous day. But as it is, he heals this woman right here, right now, right there in the synagogue on the Sabbath day as he is teaching. And I know it's hard to imagine then that this is not on purpose. And the synagogue official, we find Luke says he is indignant. And so he's mad. He's angry because number one, Jesus has done this thing. Number two, he's probably also upset because Jesus had brought drama into his synagogue. Uh, I was reading something a few months ago where someone pointed out something that he had learned as a preacher through the years, and that is elders don't like surprises. <laughs> and I read that statement, and I, I think I laughed out loud. Elders don't like surprises. I, that's a very true statement. And I think I know what he was talking about. As a preacher, if you plan on doing something out of the ordinary... It's generally good to always check in with the elders first, isn't it? Uh, give them a heads up. Uh, go to them and explain what you're about to do before you actually do it. And, and all of that is summarized in that phrase, elders don't like surprises. Well, what Jesus does here is clearly a surprise to this man. And the synagogue official is indignant. 
As I understand it, the synagogue official is probably the guy responsible not only for the building itself, but also for scheduling guest speakers, making sure they have the proper supplies on hand, and so on. And so here he is, he's the guy in charge, having invited Jesus to come in as a teacher. And now on his watch, the guest speaker is wreaking havoc, at least as he sees it. The official is on the hook for this one, and so he is incredibly upset. Instead of focusing on Jesus directly, notice the synagogue official turns his comments to the crowds. He doesn't reprimand the Lord, he reprimands the crowds. There are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, not on the Sabbath day. So he seems to be blaming not Jesus, but the crowds. You people are at fault because you came to be healed. And personally, I think he knows he can't really win an argument with Jesus. You can't outmaneuver a man who just cured a woman who's been in half for 18 years, and so he's using his influence on the crowds. He has no influence with the Lord. Uh, if he can make the crowds go away, then maybe he figures Jesus will leave as well. However, it backfires a little bit, doesn't it? Jesus responds to the official, but he responds very publicly, and he points out the hypocrisy. You people will water an ox or a donkey, but you are upset about this woman being healed. Not an animal, not an ox or a donkey, but a daughter of Abraham, who has been tormented by Satan for 18 years. Even today, it's easy for us to be more concerned about an animal than a person. Sometimes we have that same mindset. It's easy to get our priorities out of whack, and that's exactly what happens here. Ultimately, the Lord's opponents are being humiliated. They're being publicly embarrassed. They have no answer to what the Lord is saying here. And at the same time, the crowd rejoices. They are absolutely thrilled that this woman is healed. And so we have one group happy about a healing. We have the other group mad about the healing. You need to be a special kind of terrible person to get upset that somebody's been healed after 18 years of having bent, being bent in half. We want to be on the Jesus side of this, but it, it does give us a little bit more insight, I think, into what's coming next. So let's keep looking then at Luke chapter 13. And we're looking at verses 18 through 21. Luke 13, 18 through 21. So he was saying, What is the kingdom of God like, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. And again he said, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour, until it was all leavened. We now come to two of the shortest parables in the four gospel accounts, and they're both about the kingdom of God. The kingdom refers to God's rule. If we're talking about a kingdom, we obviously need a king, that's God, and we need subjects. That would be anybody who recognizes Jesus or God as their king. Generally speaking, as we've discussed before, references to the kingdom before Acts chapter 2 refer to something coming in the future. And the references to the kingdom after Acts 2 refer to something that is already in existence. Acts 2, of course, is where the church is established. Often then, we can pretty much refer to the kingdom and the church interchangeably. The church is the sphere of God's rule on this earth. He is our king, and we as his people, we are his subjects. So with this in mind, we have two pictures here, starting with Jesus comparing his kingdom to a mustard seed. A man plants a small seed, it becomes a large tree, even so large that the birds are able to nest in its branches. And the second picture that uh, has Jesus comparing the kingdom to a woman who hides leaven in three pecks of flour until it's all leavened. And so in these two short comparisons, Jesus seems to be referring to the kingdom's growth and also to the kingdom's influence. It starts small and grows, even though it's practically invisible at first. God's kingdom has a huge influence. And as we discussed a few weeks ago, leaven is often used to picture sin. Usually it's bad, uh, but this is a rare exception to that. At this point, if you're following along in the harmony of the Gospels, you'll notice we have a, an extended section from John that gets plugged in here in chronological order. We have John 9 and 10 plugged in at this point. Basically in John 9, we have the healing of the man who's born blind. It starts with the disciples asking, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Kind of goes back to the whole tower falling, whose fault is that question earlier. And Jesus responds to the question by spitting on the ground and making mud. He then takes that mud or that clay, he rubs it on the man's eyes, telling him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And the man comes back seeing for the very first time since birth. And then there's this huge dispute over this and whether Jesus really is from God. The Pharisees get the man's parents involved, they grill them. 
They interview the formerly blind man at least twice. They conclude by kicking the man out. In John 10, Jesus refers to himself as the door. I am the door of the sheepfold. Uh, then I am the good shepherd. Then we have the religious leaders. They have a disagreement as to who Jesus really is. Toward the end of that section in John 10, we're told that it is winter. We don't always think about Jesus teaching and preaching in the winter, uh, but we do have that reference, uh, Jesus preaching in the winter in John 10, verse 23. And at that time, uh, the Jewish leaders are pressing Jesus to explain who he is. And by the time we get to the end of John 10, they actually pick up stones to stone Jesus to death, but he eludes their grasp. So they're ready to kill him right there on the spot, but Jesus escapes and he gets out of there and he is not killed at that time. He gets away. And so we're now just a few months away from the crucifixion. Remember, John 10 is now winter in chronological order. He is killed in the spring um, right there a few months after this. So let's pick up with uh, Luke 13, verse 22. Luke 13, 22 through 30. And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out and they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. Once again, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, and along the way, somebody wants some clarification. Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? Obviously, these people have either been listening, because Jesus has said things like this, or they've heard others talking about what Jesus has said before. And so he repeats it here, encouraging people to enter through the narrow door. And so just thinking back to what he said in Matthew, I think we've concluded before that, that he did not make the gate narrow to make it hard for people to find. It's narrow because few go through it. And so there needs to be some actual difficult effort, some hard effort uh, put into finding that narrow way. Uh, starting in verse 25, we have a picture of the judgment. It seems that uh, God is pictured as the head of a house who has locked up everything for the night. And once that door's locked, nobody's getting in. Those who are locked out, they might make all kinds of claims and excuses and whining, but the door is not opening. And those on the outside are cast out into a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some of you are familiar with the gnashing of teeth. I think after uh, several years of getting harassed by my dentist, I finally got a mouth guard a few years ago, and, and he was concerned about grinding at night. Uh, he said I wasn't at varsity level yet. I wasn't really good at it. I, you know, just kind of, he could see some stuff going on here and there. I was a low-level grinder, uh, but the guard has helped and fixed the problems. But in eternity, though, punishment is described with this picture, the weeping and gnashing, the grinding of teeth. We know people can grind their teeth so violently that they snap, they crack off completely and fall out. In eternity, there are no mouth guards. There is no relief. There is the weeping and gnashing of teeth. What I find interesting in this section is that those who are lost seem to be able to see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God, but they themselves are thrown out. And that seems to be part of the punishment, the realization that they are excluded. In verse 29, Jesus seems to be emphasizing that the kingdom will include people from everywhere, not just Israel. And that would be especially offensive to the religious leaders. Ultimately, though, the last will be first, and the first will be last. Let's continue on and finish with the last paragraph here, Luke 13, 31 through 35. Just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice up in verse 31, Luke makes sure that we know that this conversation happens just at that time, just as Jesus is cutting on the religious leaders in the previous paragraph. So right at that moment, the Pharisees step up and they're saying to him, go away, leave here. Herod wants to kill you. First of all, notice the Pharisees are saying this. It's not that they said this, they are saying this. This is not a one-time statement, but they are apparently communicating this a number of times in perhaps several different ways. And the message is, you need to leave here because Herod wants to kill you. Think about that for just a moment. The Pharisees want Jesus dead. In fact, in chronological order, they had just picked up stones to try to kill Jesus over in John's account, roughly the same point in the chronology. So here they are warning Jesus. Seems to me that they might kind of appreciate it if Herod would kill Jesus. So what are they doing? It seems the emphasis might be on the go away and leave here part of this. They want Jesus gone. And they are using Herod as a threat. They think Jesus might be intimidated by Herod. However, is Jesus intimidated? Absolutely not. In fact, he refers to Herod as a fox. Now, personally, it seems like we should probably avoid calling our leaders names like this. And yet Jesus does refer to Herod as a fox. And I'm, I'm not sure this is a compliment. It's not. It's an insult. But if we think about it, is this insult ever going to make it to King Herod? Are the Pharisees actually going to go to King Herod? and explain that Jesus thinks he's a fox? No, that's not going to happen. So this is actually a conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. It's not a conversation between Jesus and Herod. Jesus is letting Pharisees know that he's not intimidated by this man. And the message from Jesus is that uh, he's casting out demons. He's curing people. He's on his way to Jerusalem to accomplish something. He needs to get there soon because it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. And that right there is one of the most profound insults that I've ever think I've seen in Scripture. Jesus is saying, I need to get to Jerusalem so you people can kill me there. And this causes Jesus to mourn over the city of Jerusalem. He wants to gather the people together like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. He wants the people to be saved, but they're having nothing of it. And for this reason, the city will be left desolate. Probably a reference to the destruction of the city by the Romans in 70 AD. And they won't see him again until they truly say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As I understand this, there is a time coming when they will be begging for Jesus to come back. And of course, at that point, it will be too late. And that is the end of our class tonight, which is good because it is starting to rain here on the southwest side of Madison. Uh, thank you for being with us again tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer concerns so I can get those in the bulletin. If you're joining us by phone, I uh, hope you can call me and give me any ideas for sermons that we need to study in, uh, on, in sermon form in the coming weeks on Sunday mornings. Uh, next week, let's come prepared by uh, reading Luke chapter 14. And let's close tonight with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God who has the power to heal. Thank you for giving us your word in the form of this book that we've been studying over the past few months. Thank you for Luke. Thank you for preserving these words for us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his perfect life. Thank you for his kingdom, the church. You are the great king above all others. You know our hearts, and so we confess to you tonight that you are perfect and we are not. And so we ask for forgiveness as we forgive those who sin against us. We pray that we would be patient with each other. We pray that you would give us the courage to be good examples to the world around us. We ask that you would continue blessing us with the resources to help others. And we pray for wisdom as we share with those in need. We come to you with these requests, both thanking you and praising you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.